theyeshiva.net. So we'll continue today inside. I say that every day, right? <laughs> it's almost like good morning humor, right? It's a good beginning. It's a good icebreaker. <laughs> I want to wish up Shlema Mazel Tov on the engagement of his son, Naftali. Shatayvo Mutzlacha, Sabin Yen Adeyad. A lot of Atzlacha. Okay, so we are at Dav Chav Ches Amad Aleph. Chav Ches Column 1, page 55. On the top it says, Vayeshev. We're still in the parish of uh, Yosef and his brothers. So may let still Dover be itoi. Matoiv, Mitzvah Shaz Mangrama, Sugir Shaz Mangrama. So we're, I think, below the middle, yeah? Vot Megalton, would you say Vot Megalton? The line starts, Lizulasai, Mitzad Oitzim Bitulai. Page 55, it's around 20 lines from the bottom. The line starts, Lizulasai, Mitzad Oitzim Bitulai. Ma'almim alumim has two interpretations. The literal interpretation and the midrashic interpretation. And the literal interpretation is binding sheaves. Ma'almim alumim, I think in Yiddish it's called snopes, yeah? Nuchem vizak min alumim af Yiddish. But real Yiddish, real Yiddish. Did it? Snopus, snopus, yeah. I'm sorry, Dr. Zichmer. I have a patch. This one's a patch. Snopus, nish patch. He's saying for some people, every word is given. There's all but shot. There's all but tight, yeah. So on one level, that's what it is, creating uh, heaps, piles, groups that are connected and tied together. But the Medrash, fascinatingly, Medrash Rabbah says that the word ma'almim alumim comes from another word. And that is the word ilem. <laughs> ilem means mute. Mute. Somebody who can't speak, chas v'shalom is called an ilem, alef lamed mem. Um, there's a pasuk kirachal if neigoy zezeha ne'elama nun aleph lamed mem hey a you a sheep is silent before those who cut to hear she doesn't rebel she, a sheep doesn't protest she doesn't fight back again the word is ne'elama ne'elamti dumia David Amelech says I've been completely silent absolutely silent ne'elamti dumia. So the word ma'almim malumim also comes from the word ilim, which is silence. And uh, the Medrash has different interpretations. What would be the connection? One very famous one is ma'almim malumim. One day you're going to have a descendant who is going to create idols that are mute. Yeravim ben Avot, who is a descendant of Yosef from the Ephraim, will create two big calves. In Eretz Yisrael, Bethel and Dan, for, for Don for Jews to worship, and those are mute, mute idols. So Ma'alma Malumim, the Shvatim are seeing in this the foretaste of bad things to come. And other interpretations, Ma'alma Malumim. The Balatanya here gives the deeper interpretation that it's connected with the first idea. First idea was that the avoid of the Shvatim is to create from many one, to go into the field, to go into the field, the field of life. Yeah. Yaakov, it says Yaakov is Yoshev Aholim, and Esav is Yedei Tzayed Ish Sada. I see together with the snow, a lot of other things came blowing in this morning. Gewaldik. <laughs> That's uh, the in davening, yeah, yeah, yeah. So 
So on one level, yeah, Yaakov is in the tents and ya- and Esav is in the field, right? And that's not coincidental, that description. Because the point of Sod is the openness of the world, the outdoors. There's outdoors in a physical sense and there's outdoors also in a spiritual sense. Sod is the outdoors. The difference between an oil and a Sod is, practically an oil is a home, it's sheltered. There's a roof. There's four walls. In halachi, you call it a rishus a private domain. <laughs> a sada, now depends where the sada is, if it's a definition of a karmelist or whatever the definition is. But a sada is an open place. It's more of a public place. Everybody could walk there. Mm-hmm. And in that sense, it represents something that's more close to rishus a which spiritually is the difference between a world of oneness and a world of diversity. The Shvatim work in the field, and over there they're ma'almim alumim. They bind the sheaves, and they bring them together into one pile, which as we explained is the whole idea of the birur of the nitzaitzis, explained at length in the previous shiurim, and therefore revealing the oneness within the cosmos, and the oneness within life, and the oneness within the world, all explained at length in the previous parts of the Maim. Why is that connected to silence? The reason it's connected to silence is, he says, because Achdus always comes through Bittel Hayesh. And Bittel Hayesh is a concept of silence. Meaning, Bittel Hayesh is that the Yeshes of the world, the Yeshes, which is the egotism, the separateness, comes back and is aligned with its unity, which is basically identifying the nitzots, the alakus in it, the achdus in it, the infinity in it, where beis, reish, vav, and chaf, even if they're different, but they're part of one cohesive word, which is what alumim are, all the different stalks, even though each one has its own source in the earthiness, in the earth, but you remove it from that place and you bring it together with the other alumen. That includes the avoida of silence, bitl hayesh. The concept of silence is when somebody is in a state of reception, receptiveness, they don't communicate. Meaning communication always comes from the fact that you're not completely connected to your source. The expression in halacha that he brings, aidi de tarid le mivla, when you're busy absorbing, you can't emit, you can't spit out. Why? Because when a person is really in a state of absorption, they're in a state of, of awe. You're just completely listening. You're trying to absorb, and you're not in a position where you could become a mashpia to communicate. There's a certain detachment that's necessary, a certain independence that's necessary in order to be able to be mashpia. Moshe, is the kvat pe kvat lashon? He says he can't speak, and the spiritual reason for it because he's always in a state of receptiveness and openness to infinity. Just like when somebody is caught off guard and you're mesmerized by something, you're in awe, and you can't talk about it yet. You don't have the words yet. You're not even in a state where you can communicate it to others because you're completely in tuned. With trying to hear, it's like somebody who's trying to listen to something and understand it. And somebody says, what, 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 what is he saying? Not yet, not yet. If I start talking prematurely, I'm left with nothing. I won't be able to tell you anything because I don't know it. At this moment, what I need is complete silence. Silence in my brain and, of course, silence in my mouth. Because I'm in a state of Kabbalah. I'm not in a state of Ashpa. And the more the silence, the more there can be effective communication afterwards. Right, the Gemara says, "Mila besela, mashtuke betray." Word, a word costs a sella. Let's say a sella is a dollar. Silence costs two. It's, in other words, it's worth a lot more money. On one level, it means to shvaygin daf man zayin achachem, to reiden daf man zayin kin chachem. Right? Siyag lachachem mashtika. Silence is 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 often associated with wisdom. Look who's talking. <laughs> huh? <laughs> 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 <laughs>
<laughs> and Nathan is uh, probably would be included in that. Um, uh, it's closer to the world of silence. <laughs> you're, you're sharing them more like Nagunim. Ah. Uh. There's a line that comes, I think, from Reb Nachman of Breslov. He said, what's the difference between uh, talking and singing? It's a very beautiful line. When somebody is speaking and somebody else starts talking in middle, what do we call it? Interruption. But if somebody is singing, if I'm singing in the middle of my singing, you start singing, we call it harmony. He said the objective of life is to stop speaking and to start singing. Because there are people who are always speaking and the world is always interrupting them. But when you learn to sing, the world is not interrupting you, the world is harmonizing with you. I would only add to those words that there are people that even when they sing, they're speaking. (laughs) And there are people, perhaps, that even when they speak, they're singing. And, uh, And that makes all the difference. And if you don't believe me, you could try it at home. Next time you come home late, even though you texted your wife that you're going to be home in three minutes, three minutes means you're going to start thinking about the concept of returning home. And you come home, instead of speaking, start singing. (laughs) And then you'll see that everything will be different. So in any, sometimes we say don't try it at home, but this you can try at home. Harmony versus interruption is the difference of ma'almim alumim versus separation. So the more there is silence, mila b'sela, mashtuka betre, shtikusa betre, a word costs a sela and silence costs two slayim. It's because the, it's not just because silence is more valuable, because you don't stick your foot in your mouth, as they say, and because silence is often the best thing, especially when you're not sure, especially when there's tension. Not always, but it's often the best thing. And as the old Yiddish expression is, wise people are quiet. It doesn't mean that everyone who's quiet is wise. Sometimes people are quiet for other reasons. But wise people employ the tool of silence very effectively. Because silence has an art of its own. That's all true, but there's something much deeper. The more silence, the more words. Moshe kept on saying to Hashem, he said a few times, I'm not a man of words. But there's only one book authored by one person which is called the Book of Words, Sefer Dvarim, which begins, A little bit of uh, an irony. He says, So how are you authoring Sefer Dvarim? And of course the answer is, only a man who's not a man of words, when he does speak, you have what to hear. Because the words come from, they were, what's the word I'm looking for? Incubator. There was an incubator. You know, it's not just, sometimes a person opens their mouth and they plop. But somebody who was silent for decades, when they open their mouth, every word is very, very powerful. Because the words are not coming from a place of, you know, I have to just express myself or I have to please you, I have to make an impression, I have nothing else to do. The words are coming from a place of silence. And when words come from a place of silence, every word has a intensity and a depth to it that is very powerful. You've pointed out in the past that the, many of the other Hasidic Shabbos, their writings were so sparse. And yet the Balatanya was really so prolific. Yeah. Yeah. It matches what you're saying in terms of his own personality. Yeah, 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 yeah. Even in this part of it. Now, there's an expression, I think, it comes from the world of boxing, but it's an interesting expression. <laughs> I know mine and Schmidt, it's last seen, but it just came into my mind. Huh? Huh? Yeah, but he's not here today, okay? So uh, somebody said, uh, I'm not so afraid of 10,000 punches that a person practiced 10,000 times. I'm afraid of one punch that the person practiced 10,000 times. 
One punch practiced 10,000 times, that's what I fear much more than 10,000 punches that you did over 10,000 times. Because that one punch, <laughs> it's one. It's not, that one punch, yeah, 10,000 punches I'm not afraid of. Because it's, you know, more uh, a life that springt. But that one punch that he, he honed the skill 10,000 times, it's going to be different, the impact. That one word, that one line that came from deep silence is transformative. It could be transformative. Yeah. Just like we all know in conversations with people, you could speak to somebody for two hours, but they're not really present. They're texting, they're on their phone. So even though they talk, it's not so impactful. You can meet somebody who speaks to you maybe for a minute, but that minute could change a life. Why? Because they were f completely present. So the more silence, the more communication. Because silence is when I go back to my own source and my words are not rooted in externalities, they're rooted in primius. They're rooted in, in authenticity. There's always speaking what's called min hasafa lechutz. It's your mouth speaking, it's your lips. That's it, there's nothing inside the lips. It's called lip service. You say the right thing or you say the wrong thing. And those words will never transform you or anybody else. But words that come from silence, meaning words that don't come from my lip, they come from my, my core, my gut, my kishke vimezak, the kishkes. Right, we say on Shabbos, Hashem has all my bones, or has my etza, my core, it's different words. So ma'almim alumim is silence. We have mastered the art of silence. We have mastered the art of silence. Because whenever the yesh goes out of its yeshes into the place of achdus, in other words, remember, the closer you are to the source, there's always more unity. The further we are from the source, there's always more fragmentation. Because in the source, everything is one. The more one is margish, the one more one is conscious, the one is conscious of source, the more unity. The more the ego melts away and there is cohesion, there is harmony. The further we go from the source, the more separation, the more distance, the more replacements we need, the more substitutes we need and the greater substitute becomes my ego versus your ego. Yeah. In a marriage you see it. The more husband and wife are connected to the source, their own source and the source of everything, the more the language of unity. Not that they become one, but there is a deep cohesion, there is a tolerance, there's a respect. There is a, there's playing a song together. You're, we're, not, we're not necessarily doing exactly the same thing, but there's harmony. There's harmony. I'm singing, you're singing, but there's a harmony. The more we go away from the nigan, we go to the words, we go away from silence, we go to words, the more differentiation, fragmentation, and even divisiveness, contention, and conflict. And that's all of life. The closer to Ein Saif, the more Achdos. The further from Ein Saif, the more Pirud. The further yet, more and more Pirud. And the ultimate distance is expressed in the ultimate fragmentation, in the ultimate brokenness, in the ultimate divisiveness. And when you're in that place, it's very hard to get out of it because it's like you're just my enemy. You know, I hate your guts, you hate my guts. You're just in a place of katnus, of immaturity. One really has to be able to go from a place of words to a place of silence in order to go from a place of pirud, of fragmentation, to a place of achdus. That's ma'almim alumim from the word ilem, which is mute, silent. That's the connection of the two interpretations. So he continues further. Upchines bitlzeh, again, where the line that starts lizulase, lizulase on page 55. This bitl, when the alul is davuk in the ila, alul and ila, where the philosophic are the philosophical terms used by the Jewish philosophers of the Middle Ages, especially the Rambam and his peers and his colleagues. Ila and alul, ila and alul, very common terms. Ila is the cause. And alul is like the child, the effect. Alul comes from the ila, like the apple tree from the seed of the apple, right? Like the peach tree from the seed of the peach. 
the watermelon that grows from the seeds of the watermelon. So the seed, the seed would be the ilah, and the tree would be the alu. Right? The, the seed is the progenitor, and the seed itself has, has an ilah, because the seed comes from a previous apple, which comes from a previous seed, which comes from a previous apple all the way back to the beginning. So there's the ilah alu. Ilah and alu can translate into thousands and thousands of generations. Like, we all come from Adam and Chava. Adam and Chava is our Elah, but it's, uh, I have my mother, who had her mother, her mother, her mother, her mother, a father, all the way back to Adam and Chava. So the Klal is, whenever the Alul is absorbed in the Elah, there's no words. For the Alul to speak and become a Mashpia, instead of a Makabal, the Alul has to go out of the Elah. When the student is sitting in front of his Rebbe, there's no room for him to express his whole charisma. If he does, he's not a student. And he's missing the opportunity. You understand? Because by your ila, you really want to be in a state of, 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 of Kabbalah. That's the whole idea of, 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 of an alul. And when I'm in a state of Kabbalah, I become stronger because I'm going back. It's like plugging in your phone. It's, it's plugging yourself into your source. It's re-energizing yourself from where you come from, from your source. And then the alul can, so to speak, travel independently, become detached and become its own ila. You can't become a parent when you're three years old, right? Because why not? We all know that to be a parent, you first have to be a grown up. <laughs> That's what some of us struggle with. <laughs> and when, when, when I myself am a child, right? So I'm looking for my children to be my mommy and tati, which is what happens sometimes. You need your wife to be your mother, and you need your children to be your father and to give you haskamas. So instead of being a parent, I myself am a child. Why is it? Because there was no state of Kabbalah that was sufficient for me to become a mashpia. To be real mashpia, you have to be a real makabal. There's no such a thing of being a real mashpia if you're not a real makabal. It's worthless. It's a fake hashpa. The greatest mashpia are those who are the greatest makabal. Why? Because when they're the greatest makabal, they're in a state where they can actually connect to something inside. And then there's a very powerful uh, information and wisdom to give. And it's with a child that way. The more the child is attached, the more you can be detached and independent when you have to become independent. This is very, very, uh, this is important ideas. So he says, says, <laughs> The dveikus in the ilo who al derech mashula uber kshob beten imay. The metaphor for this is the fetus, the embryo in the womb of the mother. That's the ultimate alul inside the ilo. Push it physically. You don't see the alul. All you see is the mother. We know the alul is there. The alul is being developed. But at this point, what happens if this birth? It's called a premature birth. And if it's too early, chalila. The fetus is not viable. Why not? I want to become a mashpi. I want to become an independent person. You can't be an independent person. There's no person yet to be independent. You must have the incubator. You need to have the safety, the protection of mother for nine months. Slowly you develop every day a little more, every week. Trimesters until Be'ezer Hashem, the nine months are done and the uber is wholesome and now it can go into the next stage. And as we'll see, even the next stage, you don't emerge from mommy's womb and you, you start running a real estate business. Right? There's the old joke, according to Judaism, when is a fetus viable? Well, it's the big debate about abortion. When is a fetus viable? So one mother said when he graduates medical school. Until then, it's mesupik if uh, the whole investment was worth it. Even then, you don't just walk out from your mother's womb. It's such a long process of still being davuk, but it's not the same. There's the dveikas in the womb. There's the dveikas outside the outside the womb. It's left a nurse. You have to be taken care of. And when the baby comes back to mother's eyes, it's good for when they stop crying. You become silent. Yeah. 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 We see that a child cries, and then mommy picks up the child. And if Tati is uh, an active father, sometimes it can happen even with Tati. And uh, the child is quiet. It's like a certain... And the silence of the child is like that calmness. That It's, it's a sense of bitl. It's like the alignment. 
It's not that the child, like when we go back to Bittl, Bittl doesn't mean you're a shmata. Bittl means you're in your source and you're comfortable in your source. So this is the, the classic marshal, the classic metaphor of this experience when the Allah comes back to the Ila and there will not be words then, there will be silence. The baby, the Ubar, is not considered a mohus bifnayatsma, a distinct essence. The Gemara has an expression, it eats what its mother eats, it drinks what its mother drinks. It's even its oxygen. The fetus doesn't is not outside there inhaling oxygen. It's all the mother's experience of life. That's what it is. There's no separate experience. It's not like and the mother is really responsible for two organisms, and it's all her life. The expression in Gemara is Ubar Yerech Imaihu. Right? Ubar Yerech Imai means that halachically we look at a fetus as a limb of the mother. It's like a limb of the mother. Which is why halacha views abortion in a very interesting way. Right? Abortion is not, cons- abortion is forbidden, at least in many circumstances, but it's not considered classic murder. It's considered more amputating amputating a life it's a very serious thing but it's not murdering a separate person rather it's murdering so to speak a part of the life of the mother where does it express itself halachically if the fetus is endangering mommy's life if the fetus is endangering them, it would be like a leg yeah, or another part of the body that's endangering your life and then we say you're allowed to save the mother's life because uba yarechim either person is going to be left halila with amputated limbs which we never want to do. But nonetheless, if the person will be alive, it's allowed. So it's obviously the last resort. Once the baby is born, the halacha changes. Halacha changes, the famous expression of the Rambam. So in any case, what's the uber? Who's the uber? There's a fetus there, but the fetus's life is defined by the mother. In other words, the alul is now completely absorbed in the ila, physically and conceptually and medically. Birth will change everything. Birth will change everything. The more attachment, when you're attached, when you have to be attached, the more you can be detached and independent in an effective way. Now, this point, this point that the Balatanya is saying here is that silence comes from Dvekas. Words comes from a certain independence where you, where you leave the domain of the ila, right? You go to a nest and you see a nest. There's an egg and the, the, mother sits, the mother sits on the eggs and then the eggs hatch and the chick comes out. The alul now emerged. The egg is the ultimate alul that comes from the chicken or comes from the mother bird. And now that egg becomes a source for a new life, for a new chick. And that chick emerges so for a few weeks, it has to remain in the nest. It can't fly. Mommy has to bring food every night or Matate has to bring foods. The birds change. But then the chick flies away. When the chicks fly away, when they grow older, they have the wings, they could fly away. Now what happened? The alul could now become its own ilah. It will go search to mate and build its own nest and create a new generation. All of history evolves, develops based on this. But the paradox is the stronger the dvekus in the ilah, the more effective the independence of the alul in communication. Now that shouldn't be taken for granted because in the world of psychology, this is considered a chiddish of the last generation. It's known in psychology as attachment theory, which is extremely popular today, both in terms of education and marital therapy. Credited, I think, to a fellow, a British doctor named John Bowlby and today Sue Johnson and others. And basically, he was mechadr something. And don't take it for granted because uh, in the Western civilization, this has been considered a revolutionary idea that uh, is to today, today's day extremely, very effective in many therapy uh, disciplines. And, and the idea was that uh, not very long ago, it was considered that too much love that you show to children is not good for them. Right? Some of us even grew up, and some of you even grew up in such homes. You want you, and it was a shitta. It wasn't just uh, Tati is too busy. That could be also true, but it was a shitta. You want your kids to be independent or spoiled brats. Yeah. 
In Germany, it wasn't even allowed for children to sit at the table with their parents. There's no such a thing. You sit, Tati and Mommy sit themselves. Before you go to sleep, you come over. Sometimes there could be a little, a little kiss or a little gesture. But the idea was, you got to let these kids grow up. I don't know if you know that in hospitals, until I believe the 1960s, you'll correct me, you weren't allowed to stay with your child overnight in the hospital. Even a little kid, even a little kid, a four-year-old kid, a three-year-old today, it's inconceivable. Mommy had to go home, and Tati went home, and the kids stayed at night in the hospital if it was a week or a month, month or three months, and we call it Tough love, you got to grow up, and the more you cuddle, and the more you nurture, and the more I love you, love you, love you, love you, I love you, I'm going to stay with you. The idea was, you're actually paralyzing him. You're actually turning him into, an, him or her, into incompetent people, dependent people, spoiled people who can never take responsibility. John Bowlby was a doctor for many years, and he saw that this philosophy is doing tremendous irreversible damage to children who are left alone in hospitals with endless anxiety and horror, and nobody's there for them. And all in the name of love and justice and, and pedagogy and development. And he started to take videos, uh, illegal videos, and he made a videos of animal, I think of baboons, with anxiety separation. He went on a tirade. They called him a Meshuggah. I think they fired him. It was a war. He won at the end. He emerged, I think, early 1960s or 50s, triumphant. That today, if you have to, heaven forbid, take your kid in and you could stay there and they give you a recliner, especially if it's out of New York, they'll give you a bed and everything else. New York is a little uh, more tight. The real estate here. You have him to thank. And his point was, over many years, his point was it's the exact opposite. Attachment is what allows for detachment. The more attachment, the more detachment. The less attachment, the less there can be independence. And the classic, very simple example is, and you would wonder why anybody would argue with this, but it's always that way. Once ideas are proven and introduced, nobody argues, but till they get them introduced, everybody says you're crazy. The idea is, you or your wife, you're standing in the kitchen, you're cooking, or you're sitting in the dining room and you're reading something on the couch, and your two-year-old or your four-year-old or your three-year-old is playing Lego, and he's already been playing Lego for an hour and a half, and it's quiet, a machaya. But every 10 minutes he looks up and he sees mommy cutting tomatoes. He looks up at mommy cutting tomatoes. Mommy, look what I made. Mommy says, wow, amazing, unbelievable, right? You're going to become the greatest architect in the United States of America. And he goes back down and contently continues his Lego for another 10 minutes, again looks up at mommy and so forth, and he goes back. But what happens when he looks up and mommy is nishta? So he goes, mommy, 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 where are you? Looks in the bathroom, looks in the bedroom, looks in the closet, looks here. Okay, mommy's in the bedroom, Nishkefelech, he'll go back to his Lego. The bedroom is not too far. But what if mommy left? What happens? He's not going back to the Lego. Now he is scared. Now he's screaming. Now he's crying. Now he's panicking. What allows him to go back to do his own thing is that his attachment is secure, that he knows that mother is somewhere there, father is there. That allows him to go back to his Lego and to do his own thing. When you take away that attachment, you're not making him independent. You're actually creating a tremendous anxiety in this boy or this girl because my attachment is secure. In other words, attachment is vital. It's oxygen. It's necessary. You want him to become an independent, powerful, mature, self-confident person? You make sure those attachments are powerful, not less powerful. It's the opposite of what they thought. More attachment, the more confidence, not the less confidence. Now, attachment means that you allow for the person to be independent. You allow him to play Lego. You don't hold him on the counter tied up so he can be attached. That's not attachment. That's the opposite. This was an education. What happened a few years later was they started to realize it's not just true with children. It's true with... 40-year-olds, and it's true with 50-year-olds. And you'll be me, Michael, it's true with 60 and 70-year-olds. 
even though they may have long white beards and long payers and wear big streimlach and already have 70 grandchildren going on 80, can I in Hara? If their attachment is insecure, their independence is shattered. Their sense of self is shattered because the sense of self cannot develop if my attachment is wounded. And if my attachment as a three-year-old was wounded, I'm still looking for that attachment somewhere. Maybe in my spouse, maybe in other people. And it's so wounded that a lot of the symptoms are just coming out, even though I'm 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 30, 25. It's coming out in so many ways. And now a lot of marital therapy is based on that, how people interact with their spouses. On one hand, you want to be your own person. The last thing you want is your wife to control you. On the other hand, you desperately need attachment. Right? But it's very hard to say when you're an adult. When you're a child, it's very obvious. Mommy, don't go. Right? When you're an adult and your spouse tells you something, right? And you feel a lack of attachment, there's a wound there. So as adults, what do we do? Meaning, instead of saying to your wife or your husband, I really need attachment. I really need to feel attached. And when you say that I don't feel attached, right? And therefore it's very painful and it's very scary. What do we do? We don't, oh, I don't need you. <laughs> I don't need you anymore. I don't need you. You understand what you did? This, the pain of not having attachment is very deep. So what do I do? I don't need you. If I don't need you, if you're not my mother, I don't have to be attached to you. I don't have to be attached to a stranger. So when your own spouse becomes your stranger, then I don't need attachment from you. You? What are you? You I don't mean you. <laughs> Whoever thought, I, I thought I'm going to be even attached. You? What are you going to give me? How are you? You understand what we do? So now I justify my detachment, which is only isolating me even more. When really the truth, of course you need attachment. Of course you need to be attached to your spouse. You need to be attached to your children. You need to be attached to yourself. You need to be attached to where you come from. You need to be attached to your family. Sometimes you're not. Sometimes you're throwing under the bus. But you have to acknowledge the pain of it. Because if not, you go into a world where you're substituting those pains for fake remedies, right? And you look for new attachments. Because everyone needs attachment. Everybody. The question is what you're going to be attached to. Are you going to be attached to your elah? Meaning to things that promote your growth, that promote your truth? Or are you going to be attached to things that couldn't care less about you and will just use you to give you the feeling that you're connected to something? But everyone needs a feeling of connection. Do first taste? Of course. Of course. We need attachment the whole of our life. <laughs> Judaism calls it davening. <laughs> you ever heard that word? So attachment also recognition. Of course. Yeah, yeah. But the more attachment is our youth, the more we can develop healthy independence, right? When that attachment was so wounded, we're looking for it everywhere. That two-year-old, if mommy doesn't show up, he will look at the whole city searching for mommy because he's frightened. And he can't go back to playing Lego. Now, when he's an adult, he's not going to be standing in street corners and saying, Bami, Bami, Bami. But you know what he'll be doing? He'll be doing things to impress certain people because he needs their compliments. That's his way of screaming, Bami, Bami, Bami. He'll maybe do things that his boss should be able to say, Wow, you're a good worker. <laughs> Is that he'll do things to impress people, to, he'll have to outdo himself, he'll have to show off why. It's just that recognition that I never got. I need to feel one. And I'll do anything. And for him, that's attachment. He doesn't even need you to sit down and do the Lego with you. He doesn't need you to do the Lego. I mean, part of attachment is to sometimes sit down and do the Lego, of course. But the point is, the point is that there's a connection there. The Lego is just one example of a billion examples. There's, there's, just, there's just a connection. Yeah. So it's really the opposite. It's not attachment takes away independence. It allows for independence. All this, which is considered revolutionary psychology today, you have here. 
and mamish in the oisius. The more the alul goes back to the ila and is absorbed with silence, then it can emerge. The less it's connected to the ila and it emerges, the less of an entity it is because it doesn't have its dvekas in its own ila. Everything is connected. We're not detached creatures. We could make believe we are, but we're not. I come from my mother. I come from my father. I may not want to acknowledge it always. You may have issues with your parents. Okay, but that's still your ila. And when somebody cuts you off completely, there's a lot of pain there. Are there situations where people cannot be on speaking terms with their parents? There are exceptional situations, not regular situations. Just because your mother is a little hard to get along with is not a justification to cut yourself off from your mother. That's a crime. I'm not talking about a mother who wants to kill you or a mother who threw you out of the window into a garbage dump. I'm not talking about such a mother. Uh, there are exceptions. There are parents who are cruel, sadistic. We're not talking about that. Then you have to find new attachments, and it's very hard, yeah, like an orphan. There's orphans. Yosem v'almana ya'idid. And you have to find in God, Avi Yisayman. Abayiz, Rosh HaTevis, Asher Becha, Yerucham Yosem. He was a Yosem, a round orphan. Asher, it's a pasuk in Hoshei, Isaiah. In you, the orphan will have to find love. You have to find new love. Huh? David HaMelech says, Avi v'imi azavuni v'ashem yasveni. But people never do anybody favors when they encourage people, oh, don't talk to your father anymore for the rest of your life. Really. Genius. Genius. Don't talk to your mother ever again. Boundaries? Yeah. <laughs> boundaries? Yeah. You have to know the situation. But boundaries is not separation. Boundaries is not separation. Boundaries just means respecting the individuality of a person because false goes off. You're not in the womb of your mother anymore. <laughs> Right? I mean, she may not believe that, but uh, the fact is that you have been born. Or at least, yes, Imrim. There, there is such a svara. It's debatable, but there's such a svara. Over attachment on the part of Of course. Could that, yeah. No, could that. Yeah, it's, like, it's like not letting the baby come out of the womb. No, <laughs> end up being a, a dysfunctional malproduct in the sense that, therefore, that doesn't promote. Of course. Of course, it's like I want to swallow you up. I don't let you emerge. It's always, you know, such a delicate balance. And, and listen, none of, none of us are perfect, you know. They'll tell you, too much love this, too little love. So when do you stop? Overprotective is something different. You're overprotective on the contrary. Overprotective means I really don't trust that you can ever, uh, you can ever emerge. I want you to stay in the nest forever. I don't get you have wings. That's the exact opposite. So you have both extremes. You have like, just get out of my nest. Go, go, go. Figure yourself out. I don't have wings yet. So I'm looking for wings. I'm just searching for wings. And then there is, no, you stay in the nest forever. You stay in the nest forever. You're my little, little baby. I'll make you oatmeal every morning and I'll give you bubble baths. You like that? So uh, so this is very, very deep. The more attachment, the more you can go out. And, and, and you, you see it constantly. You see it with husbands. You see it with spouses. People who have good marriages inside their homes, in the privacy of their homes, right? All day, he's out there. It's a different type, a different type of person. There's an inner wholesomeness. There's an inner wholesomeness that allows you to be a really independent person. You're rock solid. Because your attachments are powerful. Attachment in Loshan of the Balatanya is called dvekus. It's actually what it really means. Or in, in more, more elaborate, it's the dvekus of the alul in the ila. Okay. Continue tomorrow, Bezir Hashem. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. It doesn't replace. Das is ganz the ganze tachlis. Yeah. <laughs> the key of trauma. What? What? Yeah, the separation. Yeah, yeah. You banana that the teacher didn't protect the You didn't protect me, and I'm not safe. Right. My attachments are wounded. If you didn't feel safe in your home, if you didn't feel safe in your home to express your emotions, 
to get your needs. One kid can be traumatized by a certain situation, and another kid not. Same situation. Right. Their attachment needs are different. For smachter, ruchim aboyim. Was verstanden? How do you say? I live it. Yeah. 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 It's a pelophon azach. This is considered mamish cutting edge. Uh, wow. Dismissive avoidant attachment, preoccupied anxious attachment, disorganized attachment. Wow. Okay. He's, he's taking a course on detached attachment. <laughs> Give it. <laughs> First, you have to be macabre before you can. <laughs> before you speak about it, you have to listen to it. <laughs> I think the Lashon is Ubo Yerechimoyho. If it's a Raidiv, so then. Okay, but it's a Raidiv in the womb. Yeah, but you don't have to come to that because it's a, it's, it's a limb. Even if it's a full grown human. Because the baby is killing the mother. There's a whole shakal of Ataya about it. It's the Lashna Rambam is a psaza. Ah? So much better than that. No, I think, listen, it's a very serious challenge. Like, you know, it's one of those serious challenges in life. Who? This boy. Ruchim Abayim. The Ersh to Molda? Ah? Was verstanden? Yeah. Ruchim Abayim. It's a pleasure to have you. And if you're sitting near Isaac, you're being taken care of also, I see. Because he has special privileges here. You see people who went through the war, it's a very interesting war. so than... Listen, we all have attachment. The question is how we find it. If a person doesn't have a mother, chas yeah, they still have to, they have to find it. Sometimes in family, sometimes in God, sometimes in friends, sometimes in mentors, right? In Tehillim, Hashem says he's a v'yisoyimim, he's the father of orphans. What does he mean? He means when there's an orphan, he says, I'm going to step in. I'm going to step in. Sometimes huh? they're molested. Sometimes in their molesters, yes. And the molesters know it. And the molesters know it. In the world of molestation, they speak a lot about grooming, right? Grooming. You know what grooming is? They groom the child. They compliment him. They're giving him prizes. They're building him up. They're, they're saying, here, this is a place where you're appreciated. But it's only for one reason. Because I want to use you. So that's sometimes the worst, because that's when the attachment gets betrayed. And now you know that you can't trust anybody ever again, because those people who were supposed to create a nest for you were the ones who created, you know, uh, the ultimate destruction. It was a trap. The and here, the attachment becomes so wounded, because it's not just I didn't have it. I was given, to, I was given it, but all as a lie. So that's where the person really has to find just a whole new attachment. It's, 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 this is the stuff of a lot of people's lives, a lot of struggle. But the language, the language was completely unrecognized. It was not recognized. Yeah, you have to nurse your kid, you have to take care of them, but <laughs> it's not, cuddling, love, it's not good, it's not healthy. It just makes them spoiled and rotten and, and incompetent and paralyzed, they can't do anything. This was mamish, it was a real thing. Especially in Britain and Germany, oh, over there was. <laughs> I 
I'm saying people think Jews had an issue because of uh, the Holocaust and, and this, they couldn't show emotions. That was Jews an extra parsha. It's an extra part. But besides that parsha, society bechlal had a full of shit. Uh, but this Maimer is arguing the exact opposite. That the more dveikus, the more uh, you can come out. But you have to have the silence part. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is considered new, uh, new material. Everywhere, accepted everywhere. Okay, listen, Jews who follow Torah, they had their own thing, so they follow Torah, but within Torah itself, listen, you follow your nature. <laughs> but in Torah, can you get it? One such matter. I'm saying in Europe, it was such <laughs> Not just... Like even by us, we... What? Yeah. 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 Okay. This is not a study to respect. I'm saying respect is... Oh, huh? Respect is a, is very important. About eating at the same table. Right, right. But respect is not about distance. Respect is actually about safety. It means that somebody in this house is in charge. That's it's not a distance. That's safety. You know what I mean? Yeah, you feel more safe that there's a father and a mother who make decisions, who take responsibility. We often look at respect as distance, like because what we hear, don't talk to me like that. That's what respect means. Don't talk to me like that. Don't ask questions, right? You're dumb, you're stupid, you don't ask questions. That's how we define respect, means be quiet, shaita. I'm brilliant, I make this, that's not respect. That's you using your authority to be, <laughs> to, to do stupid things. Because very often kids say, Why? And actually, because you didn't have a reason. <laughs> right? You didn't have a reason. It wasn't thought out. And the kids picked up on that. So they say, why? So now you're a little stuck. Yeah? So what do you do? So you start screaming. Flagnished! What do you do? You think he doesn't know? So that's respect that's coming because I myself am a child. You understand what I'm saying? That's not real respect. There's nobody to respect. Because you yourself are being impulsive. Your kid is actually being much more uh, <laughs> thoughtful. He's ahead of the game. So we go crazy because I'm going to lose my authority. So I scream at you. That's not respect. There's actually nothing to respect there. I know, I know. In orphanages, they had this shit in us. I know. Yeah, yeah. They they did today a lot of experiments with the animals. I think uh, monkeys and this. When it's not held, when it's not held, they often die. They push it. Need a physical touch. Not only that, I read I read once a research paper, or one of the books I read. They did an experiment. Fascinating. There was a monkey or baboon that was orphaned or didn't have a mother. And in the cage, it had two options. One was like something made of stone, but it had milk and it had nutrients. And the other one was a, a cuddly, furry uh, monkey, but it was fake. But it gave that feeling of, uh, uh, of cold. And that's where it went. Even though it meant it was much more hungry and it got less nutrients meaning the emotional feeling of that warmth was more important than physical survival. And you can't argue with that. This is, this is, uh, nobody told the baboons what they want uh, this. And they saw it, they saw, they did it again and again and again. No, I know, of course, there's vitamins that come from touching, I know that. It's all connected to physical nutrients. But in other words, it's not just you have your milk and now be quiet. There's the connection that is crucial. It's crucial. People must have connection. When we don't have connection, we are not fully human because we are connected. That's the point. If I'm really not connected, I don't need connection. But we, who's not connected? You're connected. 
So in terms of evolutionary psychology, it's because of evolution. And evolution dictated that people have to be together so we could fight against the animals. Alpiteida, it's no, because everything is part of one. It's achtos. It's not an evolutionary survival skill, and therefore today we need connection. It's it's oimeka inyan of life. The, the closer you get to the etzem, you're going to see oneness. And in the nekuda of everything, it's all achtos. So to deny that is to deny reality. On the other hand, we also need independence. Because <laughs> we live in the world of, of, of Shvira Sakela, meaning God wants you to be independent. He wants me to be me and you to be. He doesn't want us to be the same. He doesn't want me to stay in my mother's womb, loy Lamvad. And that, that, that tension between the two is the core on which everything revolves, to, 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 to heal that tension. Reb Moshe, verstehst? Oh boy. What a Ah? Saramashkim. Reb Yechiel, a dank for him, Kimen. Chavis Kimen Marganach. You know, we grew up in a completely different environment. There's a lot of love where I come from. So once I came here and I started to read the books, and one of the books I read about Lit Shigodla, and I got to the point where <coughs> the daughter who wrote the book described that the father never kissed him. That's the time when I closed the book and I put it aside. I never picked it up again. I just couldn't take it. <coughs> Some people actually, they see it as a source of pride, sure. as it's greatness. Of pride, it's new, whatever else, uh, whatever the reason was there. What I had with the Not so much, I think more intellect. In other words, you don't let your emotions control. You feel love, so what? And like everything, there, there's a point there that's very powerful, but it's, it's often so... Uh, Distorted. Not huh? Not always ego driven. Not always ego driven. <laughs> Some people are trying to do the right thing and be idealistic. It's not always ego driven. Maybe that. Or maybe even it was like almost a shit that this is the right thing. This is how you raise good kids. They'll even have a source. And Tak, if you don't understand it, it's a good source. This week, last week, Pashab is Vayigash. Yosef meets Yaakov after 22 years. Yosef is kissing, hugging, embracing, crying, and Yaakov garnished. Why? He's saying Krishna. See? 22 years. I'm busy with Shema. So now imagine this seat. Yosef is like, Tati, Tati. Laman, tiz, 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 tiz. Tati, tis, tis, kiddo. Right? What does that look like? Zesto? How good that's. No, Yaakov loy noshko, how you cut a Krishna, that she brings. Huh? Afterwards, you After Krishna. After Krishna. Sure, afterwards, it's a good for afterwards, he said, a musa now I can die. Nobody says he wasn't happy. But the physical kissing and this, then he didn't do. When he met him, he didn't. After, perhaps, he doesn't say, but maybe after. Oid is Yosef. Take a look. Why are you saying Krishna? He was not. Yosef is Merkavtoi. Yisrael Oviv. Vayere love, Vayipal al Tsavara, Vayevk al Tsavara of Oid. Only one person was doing this. Who? Rashi says Yosef. Where was it? Was Yaakov? Hayakari Krishna. Ah. So there's two stages here. So the Maharal writes that Yaakov at this moment experienced the greatest moment of love in his life. So what did he do with it? He said, Kirshma. He gave it to Hashem. 
That's what the Maharal says. Here again, you could learn it in two ways. This is without the Bosh- with Chesidus or without Chesidus. Without Chesidus, what's the Pshat? Pshat is, kids, all your kids are wonderful, but God is God. The moment, moment great love, you take it, you give it Tasha. But Chesidus is the opposite. The greatest love Yaakov could give Yosef at that moment was the love of Shema Yisrael. That was the greatest gift he can give Yosef. The moment he could connect to his love with God's oneness, it's eternal. I could. Ki- uh, it was the truest unity. It wasn't trying to go away from Yosef's love. He was giving Yosef the ultimate love. That's how Yosef understood this very well. Yosef understood this very well. Or to put it differently, a little more poetically, if Yaakov would have kissed him, how long would that kiss last? 10 seconds, 30 seconds, 50 seconds. Instead, instead Yaakov said Shema. How long did that kiss last? Today when I say Shema Yisrael Hashem Alekein Hashem Echad, I can experience Yaakov's kiss to Yosef. That's what he did. It's not that he didn't kiss Yosef. He gave him a kiss that would last for eternity. You know, but you have, to see, you have to be able to see it that way. You have to see it that way. Yaakov wasn't running away from his child. He was bringing his child's love, the love to his child, to a place of eternity by aligning it with oneness. A yid says today, Shema Yisrael, Yaakov is, he could feel Yaakov's kiss. And I thought that Yaakov was... Uh, Expressing basically the unity with Yosef in the in the most powerful. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I mean, it was that unity. It wasn't the. Sh- oh, it was that. The ultimate unity of a father and a child is rooted in the unity of Hashem Alekein Hashem Echad, because all unity is rooted in that. Right. All unity is rooted in that. Especially the unity of a father and a child. We call Hashem a father. Till this moment, he was like in a state of separation. Yeah, it's a complete separation. Not only that, Rashi says, ruach Yaakov aviyim, Till then, the Shechina did not dwell on him. So when he met Yosef, it wasn't as he met Yosef, the, he met the Shechina also. God became one, so to speak. It was a very deep celebration. He wasn't just a father meets a son, we kiss each other, we're excited, our bodies are excited. Eternity is excited. Being in a state, state of depression, he could not experience, he couldn't experience unity anymore. Right, there was no unity. He was completely yeah. depressed. Yeah. So you read the Maharal, you don't understand the Oymik. It looks like the Maharal says, this is your greatest moment of love, yeah? Give it away. <laughs> and what's with Yosef? Okay, <laughs> he'll have to work it out. It's really the opposite. He gave him a deeper kiss. He gave him an infinite kiss. He gave him a kiss that doesn't, what's it called? The gift that keeps on giving. What do they call it? The gift that keeps on giving. He gives him the kiss that doesn't end. It wasn't that he started. He says he was a, he was a middle Christian. It wasn't like he just... It says he was reading Krishna. The question is why he couldn't read Krishna before. Why he couldn't read Krishna after. That's a good shayla. Krishna, you have three hours. That's a good child. There's a brisk of art. You want to? You want to hear a litv? You want to hear a litv shavart? It's going to be a different style, though. Oh, I know. By Ruiigzich, what do you have with this? <laughs> I'm very easily affected. <laughs> they say it from a pchayim briske. It's a geshmak of art. <laughs> <laughs> Everything complements each other, don't worry. We don't have to run from anything. Huh? The Bchayim says, I say, that's what they say from the Bchayim Briska, that it's a, it's a, it's a real literature of art, that uh, Hashem told Yaakov, go down to Egypt, don't be afraid, right? The Yosef Yoshis Yodei Alei Necha. Yosef is going to Put his hands on your eyes. Hashem told him, 
You're going to go to Yosef, you're going to meet him, and he'll put his hands on you. In other words, you're going to be with him before he does. Says Reb Chaim, Yaakov's coming down to Mitzrayim and meeting Yosef was all a mitzvah. Shem told him to do it. The Allah is a Isaac be mitzvah, put him in a mitzvah. So as long as he was going to Yosef, he was being Mekayim a mitzvah, so therefore he's put from Krishna. So Yosef, right when it came morning, Yosef said Shema. But Yaakov was in the middle of doing a mitzvah. The moment he saw Yosef, he finished the mitzvah. Now he's Mekayim in Krishna. So Yosef, oh hey, Yosef, a mitzvah. Yosef did Krishna in the morning. He didn't have a mitzvah. He did it later. He woke up. He said Krishna. Yaakov was an Isaac with mitzvah. Put him in a mitzvah. But he met Yosef. Ice mitzvah. I'm done. We did the mitzvah. I'm here. I saw you. This. You touched me. You put your hands on my eyes. Good. Now I'm a chayv in Krishna. <laughs> ah, the hest. <laughs> if, uh, if a Hasidic person said that word, a lit lap is so cute. Cute. Chayim brisker. In Chabad is a story, a Moira de Kamaisa. Huh? It had to be in the morning. It had to be in the morning. Matachanga ibn Brachas. So uh, the fifth Lubavitcher Rebbe was the Rebbe Rashab. And he had a son who was the previous Lubavitcher Rebbe, the Rebbe Rayatz. And he was learning with a Chavrusa one night. It was one bedroom apartment in Russia, the city of Lubavitch in Belarus. And the Rayat, Rabbi Yisavitzchak, who later became the Rebbe, was a small baby in the crib. And his Chavrusa was a Yid, the Rav of Paltava, Rabbi of Mordechai Bespalov. He took a look at the Rebbe Rayat as a baby and he said, you could see from his face, the Kedusha Samachshava Shaloi. You could see from his face the holiness of his thoughts of the baby. So his father, the Lubavitch Rebbe, had a said he had a unique taiva to give the boy a kiss, to give the boy a kiss. Then he thought to himself that uh, he wants to substitute that kiss, and instead of kissing him, he sat down and he wrote a maimer chesedus, a very deep maimer. It starts off marabu masach hashem. And he kept it in his drawer. When his son became around 12 years old, he told him the story. And I think two years later, he gave him the mimer, and he said these words, Nadir achsidr shekush. Here is a chassidic kiss. Atkan. And his son told over the story that he heard from his father. That's the maimer. If you look at it... (laughs) You want to kiss your child, so you go write a mimer. I mean, kiss him, right? Do both. It's a very deep story. You could kiss your kid. How long does it take to kiss your kid? Three seconds, yeah. He's sleeping. You're happy. He doesn't know about it, yeah. How long did, how long did it take him to write a mimer? <laughs> could be it took him a day, a week, hours. So you understand? So there's an energy that I want to give out. What do you do with that energy? That energy is not, it's energy. It comes and goes. Next, now I go eat sushi. He took that energy and he did something much harder. He immortalized it in his maimer. And when his boy was 14, he gives it to him. And he said, this is a kiss from 14 years ago, 12 years ago. Why did he do it that way? Why can't you just give him a physical kiss? Because you know his son is going to go through a lot. And when his boy is 60 years old, he can open the maimer and feel his father's kiss. He could look at it. When I was two, when I was one, my father spent a whole night sitting this only as a kiss. It's such a powerful idea. His father passed away years ago. He doesn't have a physical father anymore. He can open up a maimer and say, here's the kiss. So he wasn't trying to minimize the kiss. He wasn't trying to detach. He wasn't trying to be an intellectual, cold, uh, prolific, uh, brilliant man who doesn't get emotional. He wanted to elevate the relationship to a place of eternity and infinity. Verstehst? Nadir achsidish kush. It's not a kiss that's not physical because we don't believe in connection. 
On the contrary, I want it to be a kiss that never ceases. How do you kiss your child nonstop? <laughs> Without choking him. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. What's the source of it? Yaakov's Krishna. In Andrevete, Yaakov at Givald Geben Yosef, Achsidish Akush. What's Achsidish Akush? Shema Yisrael, Shem Lagad Shem Lacha. Not he didn't want to kiss him. He wanted to give him the ultimate kiss. That's Yichud, no? Svasema says, Why didn't Yosef say Krishna? Yaakov given a flume yid, Yosef given a flume yid. So I told you the Bchayim's answer. You know what Svasema says? Huh? No, because Yosef. Svasema says, Yosef's Chiddush is that he can be hugging somebody and kissing somebody and he's still saying Krishna. Because <laughs> Yosef's idea was that even in Egypt, he was still connected. So he says, for Yosef, oneness doesn't mean you go away from the world. Yosef could kiss and hug and that's his Krishna. <laughs> I'm saying Yosef was in Mitzrayim and he still stayed connected. That was his Chiddush, right? That's what the Svasama says. It's even a deeper, even a deeper Indian. In other words, he didn't say Krishna through saying Krishna. Yosef at the surface looks like a very, the prime minister of a country and that's also Krishna. But Yosef, the Achdus of Hashem didn't express itself only in Zayn Kishin is given the Krishna. By Yosef, kissing another person is not an interruption of Krishna. Thus is Krishna. Huh? Yeah, I don't think most people would understand what the Svasama says. Chredvig and Yaakov and Yosef. Everybody have a wonderful day. Mwah! Mwah! <laughs> Knew how long did that last for? <laughs> <laughs>